or you've been here since inception. Um, you're part of this family, and so um, we're grateful to be here in the midst of our cares and encumbrances and all those things that weight us down or aggravate us and irritate us and all the rest, which are effects of sin nonetheless. Grateful to be here, and um, I hope and pray that you will see this as a condescending reprieve from the Lord, and more importantly, a reminder of things to come. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask you to open your bulletins, if you would. And as you open them at the top, you'll see that uh, our theme of worship this morning is that God is the Prince of Peace. And um, while that's one of the titles here, presumably four titles here, the adjectives of these titles could be titles in and of themselves and often are. Um, but Wonderful Counselor, uh, which we'll hear a lot more of today, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Um, those are titles that, uh, as we remarked amongst ourselves this morning, we visit once a year. We make sure that we visit those titles once a year because it's Christmas. And it's in the Christmas passage or one of the Christmas passages. Um, my encouragement to you in light of this passage is that don't, don't make this a Christmas passage. We, we should have these names of our Lord on the tips of our tongue, and we should use them regularly in our uh, conversations with one another and in your conversations with the Lord. So uh, that's, that's really, at this point, uh, all I want to direct you to is these names are familiar to you. Um, use them in your daily thoughts and life uh, to the degree that they are familiar and make them, um, again, just a daily part of your life so that you, you uh, once you understand what wonderful counselor means, uh, you'll become dependent in, in some way on the references to our Lord that those two words imply. Again, which you'll hear more of today. But certainly, uh, Prince of Peace, which we'll also visit a little bit later as well. So with that, I'm going to open us in prayer and uh, think upon these names uh, that are in this passage, and um, we will be ushered into worship. So let's, let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that you are indeed the Prince of Peace, that you establish peace. Our prayer this morning is that we would, as we engage in worship, uh, but more broadly, that we'd be a people who um, have a growing sense of what true reality is, and that is that we have been brought into a peaceful relationship with you. And because of that, we can rest in you, and we can rest in our circumstances uh, to some extent. We know that this is, uh, we constitute the church militant, and that these times are, are still uh, uh, engaging in the presence of sin, and, and so therefore thoughts and actions are tainted with sin. Nonetheless, uh, we've been brought into a peaceful relationship with you, uh, contrary to what's represented more largely uh, in our circumstances and in the world. So we're grateful for that, and we pray that as we enter into worship now, uh, that we would have your names on our mind. Please continue to pray. And the angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. I would encourage you now to, to raise up with me your voices in unison as one body as we uh, engage in the same. We'll do that by singing hymn number 80 together, hymn number 80. We 
you stand with me? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that you are indeed the Prince of Peace, that you have come, you have established peace in the hearts of your people with you. Our prayer is that we would offer up our worship to you while in the presence of sin, a praise through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that your name again would be lifted up, uh, honored and esteemed most highly, and that grace would grow from a whisper to a shout with the lips of your people this morning. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Please be seated. <clears throat> While our Lord has established peace uh, with us in him, uh, nonetheless, uh, we are still in the presence of sin. And that is ever so evident in our thoughts and our actions day in and day out. We have a constant reminder that uh, the fullness of peace is yet to come. And when we worship our Lord, um, we have an opportunity, particularly in the Lord's Day, but every day, um, to acknowledge uh, where we're at and what is to come by confessing the reality that the presence of sin is indeed in our lives and takes its toll uh, as a matter of practicality. And so we do that simply by acknowledging that, by confessing our sin. But we do so remember, we do so remember that he is the Prince of Peace and he's established peace. And it is in the larger orb of peace and that context in which we confess our sin. And so worry not when you confess your sin. Worry not. But confess your sin, certainly with contrition, but without, but certainly, and also with great joy and confidence. So with me, um, the, our confession, our prayer confession is in the bulletin. Uh, we'll pray this prayer together, and then we'll have a silent time of confession, and I'll close this. So if you would, pray this prayer with me. O oh God, we have taught others, and yet have not taught ourselves. While we profess to know you, we have denied you by our works. We have named the name of Christ and yet have from iniquity. You have brought us up as children, but we have rebelled against you. Your word has been to us a precept upon precept, line upon line, 
And yet, like the man who looks at himself in a mirror, we have gone away, forgetting what we are like. When some have been overthrown like Sodom and Gomorrah, we ourselves have been as brands plucked out of the burning, yet we have not returned to you. O Lord, speak to us. Let us not return to our folly. Show us your steadfast love and grant us your salvation. You have exalted Jesus to your right hand as leader and savior to give us repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Forgive us, O God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please continue to pray. Oh God, as we um, give due diligence, um, diligent thought to and recollection of our sin, um, our sin is great, uh, and yet we remember so very little of it. So we're grateful that you cover all of our sin regardless of our, uh, our sinful disposition not to remember our sin. And so you cover it all, past, present, and future, minor, major, whatever it may be, oh God, we're grateful that you have put sin away. The power of sin to reign in our lives, uh, the penalty of sin which we ultimately deserve, and you've done so according to the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we look forward to that day when you shall settle this matter most fully in the age to come where the very presence of sin will be eradicated. We look forward to that day, O oh God, but until then, may we be a people who march for you. We march to your rhythm and your drum. We march with anticipation of the trumpets blaring, and we march uh, as the church militant uh, to the nations, proclaiming peace that you've established. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, look no further than this passage. It begins by saying, fear not. You can't tell somebody not to be scared unless you deal with what scares them, right? And in the end of this passage, he does exactly that. He says, fear not, but he just doesn't leave us dangling to imagine why we shouldn't be scared. We shouldn't be scared and we shouldn't be fearing because he's established peace. And so we ought to be living our lives not fearfully or with timidity. Uh, but with boldness and confidence because he has uh, defeated the enemy. He's defeated his power in our lives. He's put away the penalty which we so rightly deserve and has called us to be in a peaceful relationship with him. And so that peace is not uh, demonstrated through the cessation of nations warring, but rather he's dealing with the fundamental reason why nations war, and that is sin. So you and I ought to live in light of what Paul said. Allow the peace of Christ to reign in your hearts. Allow the peace of Christ to reign in your hearts. That's clearly calling us back to understanding a passage like this that makes it very, very clear that we've been brought into a relationship with him that can never be eradicated. So if you understand that, and if you're trusting in that reality that that's what Christ has done, then you're a child of God, and not you, I, your sin, my sin, or anything else can ever separate you from the love of Christ that has been demonstrated on the cross and applied to you and me to bring us into a relationship. With that glorious, glorious news, I would call you now to join me in celebrating as we sing hymn 197 together, hymn 197. Please stand with me. Comfort, comfort ye my people, speak ye peace, the 
blessed our God, comfort those who sit in darkness, mourning meet their sorrows good. Feed me to Jerusalem, above with waits for them, tell her that her sins I cover, and her warfare now is over. Her sins our God will pardon, what in darkness did. All that well deserved is anger, he no more will see or heed. She hath suffered many heartache, now her grace have passed away. Change her pining sadness into ever springing gladness. For the herald's voice is crying in the desert far and near, bidding all men to repentance since the kingdom now is here. All oh, that warning cry obey. rise to meet him, and the hills bow down to greet him. Make ye straight what long was wounded, make the rougher places plain. Let your hearts be true and humble, as befits his holy reign. The glory of the Abroad, and all flesh shall see the token that his word is never broken. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Luke 2 goes on. And it came about, and the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. God calls... by the glorious message of the coming of Christ. And the initial response, the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to come and see. And that's dedication. That's a desire to come, to, to go to. And, and, and then in Christ, we know that that blossoms over into serving and loving and giving and the whole bit. And so this morning, as we walk our way through Luke 2, we are walked through the exercise, the, the, the process of worship. And so it's our privilege now this morning to come and to come and see, to come and give, to come and, 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 and dedicate and, and devote ourselves unto Christ. So we're going to do that now. We'll do that through a variety of ways. One will be through giving. Another way will be through praying. And lastly, we'll be praying a corporate prayer um, through a hymn. So as the plates are passed, though, come and see, come and give. Give your heart and thus your life to the Lord. Would the ushers please serve us?
Let's pray together. Father, what a delight it is to gather before you and give you ourselves this day. To do more than just simply sit back and appreciate what you are and what you've been to us in the Christ. But the Lord, to come and see and to give and come and, and serve and come and devote. And so, Lord, we do that this day through these gifts, through these offerings at this time. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. You bring a peace, which is a peace that this world does not know. It's not an absence of violence or the cessation of warfare, but ultimately the absence of alienation from you. The reconciliation to you, our God, on account of our sin. So we come this day and we thank you for being our Prince of Peace. And Lord, our hearts go out to those in our Jerusalem who do not know you. Family members, neighbors, childhood friends, best friends at one point. Men and women who, whose life is, is futile, though it may be filled with all kinds of stuff from this world. Lord, we pray that your grace would be abundantly obvious in the Jerusalem in which we live. With the result that brothers and sisters might come into your kingdom. Future brothers and sisters would come and, and uh, confess Jesus Christ as Lord and be reconciled unto you. Lord, we know that every one of us have loved ones or friends or family. We pray for them this very moment. Please, O oh God, redeem them from their sin before it's too late. Redeem our, our, our ailing parents, our, our brothers or our sisters by birth who, who do not know you, our cousins and our aunts, and Lord, our neighbors and our friends. Lord, we pray, be the Prince of Peace in their lives as you have been in ours. And Lord, with that, we lift up to you, brothers and sisters in this body who themselves are, are, are facing grief this day. We think of the Greenwiches and the loss of a stepdad and a loved one. We think of the Mustos and the loss of, of a grandma. And um, we pray for them that you would be their God and that you would be their peace, and that both services, O oh Lord, by your grace, would the gospel go forth, whether it's in the service, or whether it be through the conversation before or after. We pray, Lord, that the gospel will go forth and redeem and save. Be their God, comfort, and be their peace, their, call, uh, their consolation, and joy. We think of others in this body who are facing health issues. We think of Elizabeth House's mom, who tomorrow will be having surgery, and we ask that you would guide the doctors as they operate upon her, that, that it would go well, and that it would be uneventful, and that um, she would be able to be cured, healed from these burdens. Father, we as well lift up to you um, and Mary Cassidy, who is at home suffering the pain of kidney stones. We pray that you would um, be her consolation and her peace, but as well we pray for her healing and her healing quickly. And that, Lord, you give her grace to endure that pain unto your, your glory. Father, as well, we lift up to you um, the Ross's niece, Megan, who this past couple weeks ago was diagnosed with um, a lymphoma. And we pray that, we thank you that she knows you. We pray that she would not um, suffer through this cancer with fear and with uh, trembling, but that she would go through it with the confidence that comes from knowing a God who, who reigns and a God who is good. So grant her the grace to suffer well, but Lord, we pray for her healing and for the Rosses that you would give them grace to minister to her if you should uh, give the open um, um, opportunity. Father, we pray for those who in the body of Christ this day are in conflict. Um, Lord, in conflict in relations, in the body of Christ, we pray that you would grant that, that we would love your peace so much that we would be willing to be wronged. But we also pray for the brother or sister who are in conflict because of you and therefore facing persecution and violence. We pray, Lord, that you would grant them the grace to live um, or to die if it, need, if, if it be your will as they have lived, trusting Jesus Christ 
And through it, O oh Lord, will the gospel be proclaimed boldly and richly that others might come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Father, bless us, we pray, with the knowledge of your peace, not just mental knowledge, but the experiential knowledge that comes from being at peace with you. And may this guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this day, this week, this coming year. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's go now to a time of corporate praying where we together lift up our heads and um, worship and praise the King of glory. We'll use hymn 198, Lift Up Your Heads. Hymn 198. And let's stand. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. Behold the King of glory waits. The King of kings is drawing near. The Savior of the world is here. A helper just, he comes to thee. His chariot is humility. His kingly crown, holiness. His scepter, pity in distress. Oh, bless the land, the city blessed, where Christ the ruler is confessed. Oh, happy hearts and happy homes to whom this King in triumph comes. Fling wide the poor doors of your heart, Make it a temple set apart from earthly use for hands employed, adorned with prayer and love and joy. Redeemer, come, I open wide my heart to thee here, Lord, abide. Let me thy inner presence feel, thy grace and love in me reveal. So come, my sovereign, and turn in. Let new and nobler life begin. Holy Spirit, grant guide us on. Until the glorious crown be won. Amen. Please be seated, brothers and sisters. Luke 2.20. Listen to the word of God. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. These people left praising God because of the word of God. It's our privilege right now to come to the Word of God and fellowship with Him, our Lord. And uh, so let me invite you towards that end to turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, and as well turn in your bulletins to that section in the bulletin that has the, the sermon notes on it. Isaiah chapter 9 is the text that we'll be studying this morning, specifically verse 6, and another name. We're looking at the names of Christ, and we know in Scripture that the word name references character. So we're looking at the character of Christ, the different names that are, that are described, descriptive of the Messiah, our Savior. And uh, uh, we've seen thus far Rada Jesse, Emmanuel, um, Sunrise from on High. It's our privilege now this morning to come and look at one more. Uh, another one, um, which is described for us in Isaiah 9-6. This is the word of God. I will read 1 through 7. 
but this is the Word of God. So let me invite you together with me to stand as I read God's Word. Hear now the Word of the Lord. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated um, the, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in, dar in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Thou shalt multiply the nation. Thou shalt increase their gladness. They will be glad in thy presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou shalt break the yoke of their burden, and the staff on their shoulders, and the rod of the oppressor as the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle in a tumult, and cloak rolled in blood, will be for burning, fuel for the fire." For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. That's Father, reading him God's word. Let's pray together. Father, what a delight, joy, and privilege of ours to come and read a passage which in other ages was but darkened and difficult to understand, says Second Peter. But to us, it is but understanding and light and, and life as we gaze upon your word and understand its fulfillment in the Messiah. Lord, give us the grace indeed, as this passage describes, that our joy and our gladness would not be because our circumstances have gotten better, but simply because we're gazing and basking in light of the glory of your name. Father, bless, therefore, this time of study towards that end. Equip us as your covenant people, mature us and grow us, that we might be servants of Jesus. We commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. One of the most heart-wrenching stories um, that I have ever heard of people malpractice took place about 25 years ago on a call-in radio program in California. It was one of those programs where I certified psychologist, a practicing psychologist, was on the air for three hours. You'd call in and, and ask um, questions and share your struggles and get basically free counsel. Well, in this particular program, a 20-something-year-old male called in, clearly despondent, clearly at the end of his rope, and he told the story, his story. As a young boy, he and his mom and his sister were abandoned by their dad, who was a cruel man. The mom was untrained, uneducated, unskilled, and so she worked at the local diner at odd, various and sundry shifts, which left this boy, Tommy, in charge of raising his sister, which he resented. All the other boys were doing sports, and he was raising his sister. All the other boys for birthdays and Christmas got wonderful gifts and they couldn't afford a thing. So he's raised, taking responsibility for his little sister and who was insecure, obviously, and struggled, obviously, and so had a lot of problems. When he was in high school, his mom one day said, Tommy, why don't you go to the store and pick up this list from the grocery store? He was, that was an opportunity for freedom, to get away from the stress of a of his home and the world in which he lived. And so he grabbed the car keys and bolted out the front door, only to have his heart sink when he heard his mom say, and bring your little sister, I'm sick of her whining. Well, he was sick of her whining. So he got in the car and he thought he'd teach her a lesson. So he, he ripped out of the driveway and drove down the, the road as fast as he could go, jerking the steering wheel to bash her body against the wall 
took corners as fast as he could, could go. And she, she, during the, the ride, his sister starts crying, Tommy, slow down, Tommy, stop it. Well, Tommy did stop it when he ran his car into a tree. When he woke up from his days, there was glass everywhere, blood everywhere, and this deep, thick smell of gasoline. In his days, he wasn't thinking. He got out of the car, and, and he just got out of the car moments before the car was engulfed with flames. He realized his sister was stuck in the, in the front seat. So he, he went to go back and get her, but he couldn't because of the flames. And the last words he ever heard from his sister were, Tommy, I love you. He shared that story, and then he shared how, from that point on, his life has been destroyed. Despondency and depression and alcohol and drugs and homelessness and all kinds of horrible things. And after sharing all these things, he asked the counselor, can you help me? And believe it or not, she said no. And they went to a commercial break. Now, as I think about that counselor... We don't know what happened off air. Maybe she did help him. Maybe as soon as they went to the commercial break, she, got on, she recommended a psycho, uh, you know, someone who could help him. But as I think about her and I, this counsel, and I think about the kind of counsel he could, he, she could give this, this young man, other than, than drugs, what is there that could help a man in this world? What is there that could help a man face the demons that that young boy was facing? There's absolutely nothing this world has to offer a man struggling with that kind of despondency and that kind of guilt. That is why I'm so grateful, brothers and sisters, that, that, that God did not leave us in our sin. He, he came to this earth. He took a, the form of man. He lived on this earth for us. He died in our place and reconciled men and women like Tommy to himself. Our passage describes it in the verse before us this morning. We are talking about the Christ of Christmas and the various names that our Savior bears as our Messiah. And this morning's passage describes him as our wonderful counselor. Let me give you the background, the setting of this text real quickly so we all have a running start. You're familiar with it because two weeks ago we looked at Isaiah 7 and it's the exact same context. But let me give it to you so we get a running start. 1051 BC, the theocracy received an earthly king, a physical king. Saul became king in 1051, and from 1051 down to 931, 120 years, it went from Saul, David, Solomon, and things went along well for God's people, Israel. Well, in 931, Solomon dies, and towards the end of his reign, of course, he was this despot. And so his son comes into power, Rehoboam, and he, of course, flexes his muscles, as you know the, the history, and says, you think it was bad under my dad? You haven't seen, seen anything yet. So the nation divided. Jeroboam, one of the generals of Solomon, went north, and he founded Israel, or at least he, he kept the name, with ten and a half tribes. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, stayed in the south as, with the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So uh, two and a half tribes stayed south, and they called themselves Judah. Well, now focusing on the southern kingdom, Judah, things went pretty well from 931, pretty well, I put that in, in quotes, all the way down to, nine, to, to, to 734, 931 to 734, uh, roughly 200 years, until... The right, you, I remember the year of King Uzziah's death, 740, Isaiah, is when he starts uh, prophesying. Well, now that the date's around 734, Ahaz has been on the throne for one year. And the threat of Assyria, this large nation from the Euphrates and Tigris River, a river Valley, they're on the rise. So the northern kingdoms, of course, felt the threat. They formed the first United Nations, and they, in essence, pooled their military to form one military to oppose the, the uh, coming onslaught of the Assyrians. However, Judah wouldn't join because Judah just got beat twice on the battlefield by Syria. And Israel. And so he wouldn't join. So because of that, the northern kingdoms, the United Nations, joined the forces to come down and depose Ahaz and to put on the throne someone who would be partial to their coalition. Well, we know that 
Um, it was at this time Isaiah came, and he spoke of a sign. Isaiah chapter 7. The ch a child would be born, and his name would be known as Emmanuel, right? We know that. God with us. And before this child was old enough to know right from wrong, the nations that Ahaz feared would be gone. And so the birth of this child signified the demise of the northern kingdoms, right? Well, we also know through dual prophecy that Isaiah 7 was but a type of the antitype, which is Matthew 1, which actually quotes Isaiah 7 in reference to Jesus Christ, that Christ is the child born to us whose existence, whose presence signifies the demise of Satan, our enemy. Beautiful parallel. Okay, well, it's that son, not the son of Isaiah 7, not the child of Isaiah 7, but the child of Matthew 1 that is being described in Isaiah 9. So we're, we're picking the story back up with this child, this verse 6, for a child will be born to us. This child, this son who is coming, it's that son that our passage then is describing, who we know is Emmanuel, the rod of Jesse, um, the, um, what is it, the uh, sunrise from on high, and um, this morning we're going to see the first title, Wonderful Counsel. Notice with me the specifics of the text, verse 9. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. That's all we're going to look at this morning is Wonderful Counselor. We could translate it Wondrous Counselor. The word for counselor is the word in the Bible, ya'atz, which references one who gives advice and thus one who imparts wisdom. So a counselor in the Bible is someone who takes the word of God and applies it in such a way in circumstances that enables the person they're counseling to know how to live, how to move, how, how to function, what to do. For example, it's used in Exodus 18, 19, when the task of leadership was too great for Moses. Do you remember that? When he brought the people out of the, um, across the Red Sea, and Jethro was there, and he has all these disputes, and they're coming to him, and he's working his, 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 his life away, and Jethro comes and says, you're going to die. What you need to do is organize uh, the nation in this way. Well, Jethro's advice in the Hebrew is called counsel. It's this word. He gives him wisdom, um, day in, practical, day in and day out wisdom, advice, how they ought to f uh, function. We see the same word in 1 Kings 12, 8 and 13. Rehoboam, when he became king, he got the advice or the counsel of his contemporaries and the advice and the counsel of his father's advisors, and he listened to his contemporaries, and of course it was bad counsel. But nevertheless, that's the word used there. It's the counsel that another person gives to um, impart wisdom unto the direction and the guidance of people in their walking. Second Samuel 17, 12 and 14, Absalom becomes king, or at least in the coup, becomes king, pronounces himself king. He has uh, 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 two different um, advisors. Um, um, Ahithophel, which was um, one that he listened to, and, and then Hushai, who was a secret friend of David, who was giving bad advice. And uh, Absalom listened to the counsel, the advice of Hushai. And so that's the same word. Thus, in the Hebrew, the word counselor references, I think you've got this in your notes, references one who gives practical advice regarding life. Advice concerning war, Battle, strategy, leadership, marriage, parenting, relationships, service, and much, much more. Now, in the context of the book of Isaiah, and this is important, in the context of the book of Isaiah, this word, counsel, ya'atz, primarily references the counsel given by, by an advisor to a king. And that is incredibly profound. The word is primarily used in reference to the advice or the counsel in the context of a king getting advice and counsel from an advisor. It's the advice given to a king. What makes this so profound, and we're going to come back to this in a little bit, is that in Christ we have become kings and queens. Okay? We'll return uh, to that. 
Now, what a need for counsel, Isaiah 9, 6. What a need for counsel at a time for counsel. Because at this time, recall, in the people of God, in the, the time of the people of God, was a black, dark time for Judah. Ahaz got, became king 735, co-reigning with his father, by the way, Jotham, till 731. But he became king in 735, and, and as king, immediately he went out to battle with the, uh, per the advice of his counselors and attacked Syria. And of course, Syria killed a lot of men and, 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 and humiliated. And so, at, per the advice of his counselors, he went out and attacked Israel. And of course, we know from that last week, 120,000 Israelite men were killed. Brave men, noble men. Bad advice. And now, these northern kingdoms were now coming down to depose him. And he, and according to Isaiah 7, verse 2, is quaking in his boots. What God's people needed more than anything at this time was a wise counselor. It's a dark time. And then forget just the northern kingdoms. You've got the, this bigger impending threat of the rise of the Assyrians just on the horizon. And we know the history right after the, of the Assyrians come the Babylonians. And after the Babylonians come the Persians. And after the Persians, the Greeks and the Greeks and the Romans. I mean, God's people from this point on were living in darkness Always as a subject people, subjugated people, humiliated people. What they needed more than anything else was wise, godly counsel. So what did God give them? What did God give them? Well, our passage tells us God didn't give them an earthly counselor. He gave them a wonderful counselor. Isn't that incredible? He gave them a wonderful counselor. You know what the word wonderful means? Pele. It, it, it's, it refers to the actions of God. It's a word used in association with God, primarily. And thus something that is mysterious, unusual, beyond human capabilities. And so something that awakens astonishment on the part of man. For example, Judges 13, 18, Manoah um, talks with the angel of the Lord, which we know is Jesus Christ. And Manoah talks to the angel of the Lord, who tells him about Samson. And what is, and, and Manoah at the end says, who are you? What's your name? I, I want to be able to tell people who I just spoke with. And the angel of the Lord said, my name is, this word here, wonderful. And the idea behind that is, my name is incomprehensible. You can't understand my name. I'm God. That's Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. And when the angel says that, we know the angel saying, I'm God. I am too. You can't know me. There's no word I can give you that would help you understand or apprehend th that with, with which you've just been uh, conversing. So, uh, so the angel says, my name is wonderful, Pele. My name is Pele. It's used in Psalm 78, 1 through 4. Listen, O my people, to my instructions. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark sayings of old, not because they're evil, but because they're incomprehensible, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not uh, conceal them from their chi uh, children, but tell to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. That's the word. It describes the wondrous works that God has done. And then if you read the psalm, the giving of his word, the redeeming of God's people from the Egypt, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the leading of the people of God by the a cloud and fire, the food and water in the desert, the forgiveness of their many sins of rebellion, the conquering of the promised land, the destruction of those who apostatize, the giving of, of a shepherd king to oversee his people. All of that are the wondrous deeds of God. There's not something we could fabricate. There's something that only God and God alone could do, parting the Red Sea by the word of his mouth. How do you fabricate that? It can't be done other than God doing a, what's the word? A wondrous, incomprehensible, amazing, a, a deed that will blow our imagination. That's the word here. 
We see it in Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of his wonders. Same word. Speak of that which pertains to his deity. Speak to that which is unique to God being God. And in Psalm 105, it was, it's things like remembering his covenant in the face of open rebellion. The fulfilling of his word, verse 19. The multiplying of Israel into a nation, 24. All the events surrounding the exodus, the parting of the Red Sea, and the wilderness wanderings, verse 27 and following. That which unites these verses uh, together, that's which, which uh, unites wondrous deeds, is the idea that they are acts that only God can do. And so divine acts, eternal acts, omnipotent acts, acts that go beyond human comprehension. So get this, at a time when the people of God's back was against the wall, God came and he gave, he promised to give perfect counsel, righteous counsel, complete, infallible, holy, inviolable counsel. That's Isaiah 7. Isaiah 9, though, is speaking about the son of, Isaiah, of Matthew 1. Notice Isaiah 9, verse 1. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. The context of Isaiah 9 is a time of gloom and anguish. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness. That's the context. These people, Matthew 1, that's us, that's our age. That's the era in which we live. We live still in darkness. A dark world and a dark time where people like Tommy don't know what to do or how to cope with the sin and the guilt and the burdens that have been placed upon him because of the, of the sin and miseries of this life. Yet God has come and gives not earthly words of wisdom. Take some drugs, Tommy. Take some alcohol. Medicate your, yourself. Or better yet, take a prescription. Brothers and sisters, there's no... Counsel, every counselor on this earth is imbecilic. Greg Thurston's counsel is imbecilic unless it corresponds with the wondrous, infallible, awesome, holy word of God. Do you see it? This passage is describing a characteristic of Jesus. He is the embodiment of divine Wisdom, divine counsel, divine, the divine word. So we read in John 1, the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. Jesus is the counsel of God. And thus we have, as he gives us his word in this book, the counsel of God. You've seen this. You've heard this. Do a study sometime. Read and study God's word and ask, what is the impact of having Jesus Christ in your life? Give me the biblical verses that describe the impact of having Christ in your life. And then write, what's the impact of having the, the word of God in your life? And you'll find that the, that the lists match. The Word of God is the written Word of God or the living Word of God. Either way, that's what Jesus Christ is. And thus, we read in Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Remember Isaiah 60 is written to the people who came back from the exile to the gloomy, dark world where they were opposed, right and left, disappointed. And when they did build the temple, it was nothing compared to what it was before. So they were depressed and discouraged. Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth. That's the air in which we live. Deep darkness, the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. That's the Christ of Christmas. Jesus is the wonderful counselor of God. And if you, living in a dark land, have Christ, you abide in the light. Read 1 John. You're children of light. You live in light. You, you function in the light. Isn't that glorious? Incredible truth. And so when we say that Christmas is the celebration of Christ's birth, recognize the meaning of this birth, 
to a king and people whose way is difficult and dark, whose path leads to death, whose life is shrouded in mystery and despair, whose surroundings are, are anything but safe. Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24, is the wondrous counselor who came to the earth to lead and so direct us unto the light of God's kingdom. And Christmas is the celebration of the reception of that counselor in his word. Christmas is a celebration of the reception of that counsel. And thus, brothers and sisters, understand, Christmas is the celebration of, it begins with the people like Tommy in a dark, horrible land, despondency and despair. Yet God came and with healing in his wings, born of a child, per, living a perfect life, bearing the sins of his people on the cross, and thus in his death and resurrection, leading forth a host of captives. Brothers and sisters, that is the wonderful or the wondrous counsel of God that we celebrate. And if you're in Christ, you know this day that you celebrate and rejoice with your Lord. Thus, no longer need we live in darkness. Hear this. No longer need we live in darkness. We can walk in the light. You realize that? It is at this very point, brothers and sisters, that we as God's people, we trip ourselves up all the time. You know, God made us to be under his authority. Genesis 1. You realize that? God made us to be under his authority. And though we fell and we were cast out of the garden, nevertheless Christ came and, and in coming he gave us wonderful counsel such that we are now walking in the light. Well, guess what? As kings and queens, what does God place us under? Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 17. If you have not marked it in your Bibles or used it as a memory verse, or been familiar with this, you really need to be. Because this is the counsel that is given to the king. And if you're a king in Christ's kingdom, which you are in, in Christ, then this is the exhortation that you and I ought to take personally as kings and queens in God's kingdom. It shall come about. This is known as the law of the king. It shall come about when he, the king, sits on the throne of his kingdom. He shall write for himself a copy of the law, on a scroll. In other words, the word of God, he's supposed to copy. They, didn't, he, they couldn't go to the store and buy a copy of the Bible. They had to take the scroll which was in the temple or the tabernacle and make a copy of himself. He's supposed to make a copy of the scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. Handwritten. His own handwriting. And it shall be with him, this scroll, this copy. And he shall read it all the days of his life. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. The word counsel in Isaiah primarily refers to the word given to a king. Jesus Christ is that counsel. Jesus Christ is this word. And it's our calling as kings to read it all the days of our life being uh, um, that we might get this. Learn to fear the Lord our God by carefully observing all the words of this law in these statutes, that our heart may not be lifted up above our countrymen, that we may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, in order that, that us and our sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Brothers and sisters, the law of the king is to, is to take the word of God and submit ourselves to it, re, stu, uh, a copy it, and read it every day of our lives and strive to get it. Submit ourselves to it unto the fear of the Lord. And as we do this, this passage says, as we do this, our children are raised up in the same way. That's the call of God. But you know what, brothers and sisters? We don't do that. We got the word of God be before us and we don't read it. Much less, hear this, much less do we strive to submit ourselves to it. It's one thing to read it, but do you strive to submit yourself to the word of God? Many times we don't do it because it's boring. I've heard that so many times in discipleship. 
It's boring. The Word of God is boring. And you've been telling me to read Ezekiel, and it's boring. I love the words of J.R. Miller in this regard. Take it from him. A young lady purchased a book. You've got this quote in your, in your bulletin. A young lady purchased a book and, and read a few pages, but was not interested in it. Some months afterwards, she met the author, and a tender friendship sprang up, ripening into love and marriage. Then the book was dull no longer. Every sentence had a charm for her heart. Love was the interpreter. In the same way to those who do not know Christ personally, the Bible seems dry and uninteresting. If the Bible is dry and uninteresting to you, it could very well be you aren't saved. Let that sit a little bit. Maybe you're not saved, Christian, false Christian. If you look at the Word of God and go, it is so boring, it very well may be you don't have a love relationship with God. But when they learn to know Him and love Him, then all is changed. The deeper their love for Him becomes, the more do the sacred pages glow with beauty and light. It's very possible, too, that while you are saved, you have so neglected fellowshipping with Christ. You see, we, we talk a lot about this. I know Dave talks a lot about this in Sunday school. I've heard him say it many times. Guys, so you memorize the catechism. So you can spout theology till you're blue in the face. Demons can do that and they shudder. Knowledge doesn't save is that knowledge the vehicle for you to have a personal relationship with Christ? If it's not, then your knowledge is dead knowledge and you will spend hell in a deeper pit of suffering because of the knowledge that you've acquired in the church. Brutal. Brothers, we're not after knowledge. We're after knowing and loving and serving Christ. Get this, delighting in the character of God. If you're not delighting his character, which calls sin a sin, and thus you call sin a sin, if you find yourself at odds with God over the issues of purity, sanctity, holiness, devotion, you're not in the word. You're not submitting to the word. So it may very well be that the word of God or your walk with God has gotten so distant from God, you've longed for God. If I can encourage you, renew your love relationship with God and understand that the word of God is nothing less but a gift that God gave to his people personally. Listen to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Incredible verses. Moses exhorted the people of God who were about ready to go to the promised land. And they had a lot of questions. We're going to the promised land to do battle. Who's going to die? Is my husband going to die? Is my wife going to die? My children, my dad, my cousin, my uncles? Who's going to die? And, and how is it going to, are we going to go there and be repelled like we were when the other uh, um, um, spies 40 years before went in and came back and said they're too big? I mean, we know this land is filled with giants. What's going to happen tomorrow? And Moses said, Deuteronomy 29, 29, I preached from it. You know the other verse. The secret things pertaining to the future belong to the Lord our God. The future is God's. But the things revealed in his word belong to us and our sons forever that we might observe this law. Do you understand what that passage says? That passage says that God Almighty, as his first gift to you as a king or queen, is the word of God. C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia. Peter became a king. Lucy became a queen. P uh, Susan became a queen. What did they get? They got gifts. Do you know the first gift God gives to any king in his kingdom is a sword called the word of God. That's what Peter got, a sword. God gave you, God who loves you, who you also say you love. Do you know he gave you the Bible to you to read and fellowship with him? He gave, this is yours. Hear this, people. This is not a religious book handed down through the ages that you somehow inherited this dusty, thick, 
home that now you got to read about people who lived 4,000 years ago. Deuteronomy tells us very um, uh, clearly, this is a love letter written to you by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the word of a God who loves you, just like that woman. Read it, understanding that this is a God who, who's good and who loves you. Brothers and sisters, if you, will, if you will read it and take it in that way, you will see it is glorious. There was a time in Russia where two boy princes were on the throne. They were brothers. They were young, six and eight. I don't know what their ages were, but they were young. And in that day, as it is in many, you've heard about this, they, the king would be in session, which means you sit on your throne and people come up with gripes and complaints and um, divisions, and they say, look, this is what's going on. We need your counsel. Well, these boys would sit in session. Well, you're not going to live in a kingdom and not have people come forward and offer uh, uh, questions to your, your king. That would be a huge insult. So people came to these boys and gave them struggles that they were having. And to the amazement of all, their counsel was profound. These two little boys giving words of advice that pretty soon people from miles and miles and miles away heard about these two boy princes, these kings, who were giving such profound, helpful words of decisions that people flocked to their court. Turns out the secret was behind their throne was a curtain where their mother, Princess or Princess Sophia, stood and she'd whisper the answer to her boys and her boys would then comment on what they should, should do. It wasn't the boys, it was the mom. Brothers and sisters, that's what the Word of God is. It's, the word, it's, it, 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 it's, it's God's Word given to us that we might know how to live in fellowship with God and how to love him. Man, we love God. How do you show that? Read the word of God. We love God. I want to serve him. How do you serve him? Read the word of God. That's what this is. It's the wonderful, which means divine origin, of divine origin. It's, of, it's, it's, it's the wondrous counsel of God. To come to the word of God is to have an oasis in the middle of the desert. Listen to Psalm 1, 1 and 3. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. How many, does that, how many Christians does that describe? Worldly wisdom. All right? Worldly wisdom says, do this and do that. And we live according to worldly wisdom. Our entertainments, our affections, our, our, our pleasures are driven by worldly entertainment and worldly counsel. This passage says, how blessed is the man who doesn't. Be, who, who isn't driven by those things. But, he, but rather, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now notice the metaphor the psalmist uses to describe the results of meditating upon God's word, of being in God's word. He will be like a, a tree firmly transplanted, is the Hebrew, transplanted by streams of water. That's the word of God which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. It's picturing a desert, and you take this plant, and you transplant it by a little stream of water, which underground um, a spring, and though it is horribly hot outside, Jeremiah 17, read Jeremiah 17, 7 and following, though it's horribly hot outside, nevertheless, that plant thrives. That's a picture of someone who is leave, uh, um, living upon, relying upon, feasting upon the word of God. Who finds their delight in Christ. And as this is the word of Christ, in the Christ of the word and the word of Christ. How blessed is that man. Incredible. But again, we come to it and either, it's either boring because we don't know Christ or it's difficult. We come across, I, I've, I've talked to so many people in ministry, in discipleship, who will say, man, I start reading it and it's difficult. There are passages in there that are hard to understand. And what happens is I get tripped up. I start reading the Word of God. I come to a passage that's hard to understand. I go, I don't understand this. This is crazy. And then eventually I stop reading. So I've tried so many times to get going, but I just, it, it just doesn't go because it's hard. 
Let me give you the counsel of, of, uh, of someone much wiser than myself. Charles Spurgeon. You got the quote there. An old man once said, For a long period I puzzled myself about the difficulties of Scripture. Until at last I came to the resolution that reading the Bible is like eating fish. When I find a difficulty, I lay it aside and call it a bone. Why should I choke on the bone when there is so much nutritious meat for me? Someday, perhaps, I may find that even the bone may afford me nourishment. Wow, what great advice. Brothers and sisters, you're reading the Word of God, you come across something you don't understand. Skip it. Why, why get tripped up by that bone? Just keep reading. And you know what's amazing? Take it from me. The more you read the Word of God, the more you see, the more you see, the more you understand, the more you understand, the more you'll understand. You see what you know, right? You go up into the mountains, you don't know trees, you won't see a tree. But if you understand different trees, you'll see, wow, that's a fir, that's a, that's a, a, a spruce, that's an ash. You, wow, this, this is, you know, an incredible land. Brothers and sisters, the more you know, the more you see. So you will find that if you skip the bones and keep on reading in the process of day in and day out, um, line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here, a little there, day in and day out, over the course of years, you will discover that all of the bones melt away in your mouth. Literally, they melt away in your mouth. When I got ordained, I had not studied scripture deep enough or long enough to be able to come down to an eschatological position. I didn't. I was ordained in a denomination where you had, you had to have definitive views on the second coming of Christ, which I held. But I did not know whether it was all mill or post mill or, or name it, historical pre mill. After eight years of preaching, I was forced to, 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 to say, what's your uh, position? And you know what? I went back and read verses that in seminary were mysterious to me. They were black and white. They, made, they were the bones in seminary. They melted in my mouth. Wow, this is easy. What was your problem, Greg, eight years ago? Why couldn't you understand this? I just preached morning and evening services, studied uh, all the time for eight years. Eight years later, I never studied those passages after eight years, but now eight years later, I look at the same passages where eight years ago were a bone had become very clear to me. Oh, that, the answer is this. So I came down with an eschatological up, uh, opposition. Brothers and sisters, that is all of us. You come up across something that doesn't make sense, pass it. Pass, keep going. And once you keep going, you'll learn, and as you learn, as you meditate, all of a sudden the word of God comes to life. One more verse, Joshua 1, verse 8. Listen to it. To the king, to the next leader, not king, but to the next leader of his people, this is what God told Joshua. Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Sounds like Deuteronomy, doesn't it? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, just like the law of the king. Read it every day. Meditate on it day and night so that you, will, you will, may, may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Get this. It isn't the reading of the word of God that causes us to have success. It is the doing of the word of God which comes after meditation. So we're not just talking about this, this blind read it and you'll be blessed. No, we're talking about read it, meditate, understand it, seek to understand it, seek uh, uh, to implement it. And in time, it'll change your life and you will live according to reality. This is the reality, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ, God, constitutes reality. He made man. He made this world. He made it a certain way. If you don't live according to him... According to his word, you will be schizophrenic. You will live in a fantasy land. Understand that. A lot of Christians live today in fantasy land. That's what Psalm 1 1 is talking about. Do not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. If you do, you will live in fantasy land. Your relations will struggle. You'll have conflicts in your marriage, conflicts in your home, conflicts in your job, conflicts, difficulties, despondency, despair, all kinds of struggle. Amazing. But if you and I meditate on the word of God and thus submit ourselves to it, get this, we are submitting ourselves to reality. 
Never, I'll never forget years ago, a, a person came up to me and said, they were raised in the church and they said, I'm not ready to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. They're in college. I want to go off and jump off the deep end. I'm not ready to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I looked at him, I think I shocked him because I didn't give him the, the response he was looking for. I, I responded by saying, really? You know what's amazing? <laughs> I'm not ready to I'm accept gravity as my personal life force. So I'm going to go down to downtown Denver, jump on one of those huge high rises, and just walk off. Because if I don't submit to gravity as my personal life force, I won't fall when I jump off that building, right? He looked at me and said, no. I said, Jesus is Lord. Whether or not you're willing to accept him as Lord or not, he's God. That doesn't change reality. What you're telling me is I want to live in fantasy land. I want to live in a world where Jesus, where I don't submit to Jesus and think I can enjoy the benefits of life. Just, just suck it in just for a couple years. Brothers and sisters, do you understand when you do that, that's no different from saying, I want to live in fantasy land because I find joy in taking a knife and stabbing myself in the leg. It feels good, specifically when I stop. Well, what, what can you with accuracy predict about my future, specifically my leg, if I spend my day and nights and weeks stabbing my thigh with a knife? You can predict with accuracy you're going to lose that leg. How many Christians are losing their life today? I don't mean their soul. Their life today, their marriages, their relationships, their families, their children, their future, because they refuse to submit to reality. Brothers and sisters, the word of God constitutes reality. Govern your life according to it. And Joshua says, you will, you will prosper and have success. Now get this. That doesn't mean money. That doesn't mean worldly success. We're talking prospering in the kingdom. What's that? That's being a tree planted by the streams of water that thrives in the desert. That's passing through the valley of weeping. It becomes a spring. That's facing the most horrible, heinous things of life and thriving in your walk with God, not giving in to despair or despondency because my good God reigns. My God, my Prince of Peace, who loves me, reigns, and I reign with him. You know, if Tommy could only understand that the God of the universe is um, incomprehensibly good. Good. His goodness is so is so awesome. So oh, it, it, it will overshadow everything in life. We begin there. God is good. Tommy, secondly, God is sovereign. God ordained the death of your sister. This good God who overshadows everything, colors all of your life, well, you know he's good. He's a God who's in charge of this universe. He wasn't taking a nap on that day. He ordained that. And the most, therefore, glorious way you honor your, your dying sister's breath is to submit to Jesus Christ. And that's to love him and serve him and honor him with your life. He will and, and, and can forgive you for that and a thousand times more sin. That's the words we give to Tommy and Sally and Joseph. And that's the word we give to ourselves this day. That is the divine, glorious counsel of God. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I won't change your circumstances, but I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am humble of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My load is light. The yoke of drugs, momentary pleasure, will destroy your life. The yoke of Christ gives life. Interesting, huh? You can serve Satan and he'll suck your life from you. Or you can serve God and he'll give you life. May God give us the grace to be servants of the living God. Let's pray. Father God, we bow before you this day and we are so thrilled. Those who have, you've opened our eyes to the reality that you are our wondrous counsel. You are the word, the living word. And in our laps is the word of, of our God. 
But Lord, we are so quick to, to, to run away, so quick to rebel. We think we know better. We think we know what's better. God, I pray you would give us all the gift of repentance this day. Any and all here who in our hearts might say, I'm doing it my way. Father, it may, in the words of, of Hebrews, in the words of Moses, it may have a passing pleasure. But we know in the end, it will cost us our life. And think of the, your word that describes the, the naive Christian. Tempted by sin, not necessarily the prostitute, though the prostitute is the word there in Proverbs 7, but any alluring sin that we think is safe and fun and no cost. My husband's gone and my bed's clean and, and, and come take your fill of it. Lord, so often sin is so alluring to us. I pray you'd open our eyes through your spirit and your word that we might see that it, as Proverbs ends, little does he know it will cost him his life. God, may we see it for what it is. And therefore, O oh Lord, May we love you and in loving you seek to follow you according to reality. May we order our lives according to your word, not because somehow it makes you love us more. We know that, God. We know that in you we have all the love in Christ. But we order our lives according to your word because we love you. Oh God, grant us the grace, therefore, to live in reality, to live according to your wondrous counsel, and so serve you and reap the benefits in our marriages, our parenting, our homes, our, our Jerusalems, our workplaces, our extended families, and everywhere we go. Oh God, come to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Reign there supreme. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers.